Good afternoon. Wow, you're so excited. Is it getting boring already after three days? I'm excited. Any idea why? No idea? No guess what happened the last two years plus. We could only do virtual sessions where this is in person. I'm a bit less excited because it's not the first time anymore. I did another session on Monday, but still, I'm super excited. So I hope you're uh, as excited as I am, and if not, I hope by the end of the session you're going to be as excited as I am. Um, I would say welcome. Anyone working with DevOps already? Or are you more on the PowerShell side of the conference? Raise your hand all the way up. I know it's afternoon. Was it a good lunch, heavy lunch? A little bit of a heavy lunch, yeah. That's why I like morning sessions, but totally fine. So about 60, 70% of you are more on the DevOps side. Or probably combination PowerShell DevOps, whatever it is. It's automation, right? Who's already integrating security? Cool. So what are you expecting from this session to learn? You're already doing PowerShell. You're doing DevOps. You're doing security. That's more security. Even more security. Cool. I like it. See your take on it. See my take on it. Even better. Because it's, it's a challenging topic, honestly, because security is broad. Uh, DevOps is broad. There are like... I don't know, a gazillion of tools where just to make it a little bit easier and obviously also because I'm part of Microsoft, I'm going to try and limit it a little bit to Azure DevSecOps where it's mainly demo based. I got a couple of slides because we needed to build slides. So I'm going to work on that a little bit. But apart from that, it's going to be demo based. If you think like this is too easy, too boring, we already know all this stuff, I would say let me know. For the other ones who did not raise your hand because you're not doing DevOps yet, and it's becoming too hard, although I don't really think so, then also let me know. Sounds good? Cool. Come on. Ah, I hate it. The recording is interfering. Don't like it. Cool. In short, what we're going to do is, super quick, just one slide, what is DevOps? For the ones who don't really know, like what is DevOps about? And then shifting to that shift left mentality. It's, I would say, an industry buzzword, one of the so many ones. It's um, about the same as Kubernetes. Who's running Kubernetes? Well, not that many yet, because we need to talk about Kubernetes all the time nowadays. Otherwise, you're not that cool anymore. But we're not going to talk about Kubernetes. Um, obviously, the middle part is the most important. What is DevSecOps? And mainly, more important, what is the tooling we have available? Where well, you're going to find out that it's not just Microsoft tooling, but basically everything around it. And then a lot of demos, I hope, and some Q&A at the end. Now, you don't have to wait all the way to the end for Q&A. If you've got a question, raise your hand, let me know, um, and, and we'll take it from there. Worst case, if it's a long question or I need to provide another longer answer or I need to show you something in a demo, then I might move it back all the way to the end. Cool. My name is Peter. Um, I'm recently a local, which is also pretty fun to, to speak to, like, somehow local audience. Anyone from around? Or you all... Traveled in, not that many local ones, okay. Everybody else super happy about traveling again? Or you never stop traveling? Or not that happy about traveling, no? I was like, yeah, you conference. And in the meantime, I moved from Belgium to, to Redmond like only three months ago. So that was pretty exciting and, and scary as well. I mean, leaving your country behind isn't always that easy, but I look forward to it and I'm enjoying it for now. Um, I don't have an American accent, so there's a lot of uh, European influence there, I would say, but. I hope it's, uh, it's okay. Um, what I do within Microsoft is a technical trainer. So I've been delivering training a uh, long time ago, started with Windows NT4 server, so about 25 years back. A um, lot of consulting background, a uh, lot of cloud architecting background. That was my new role about seven, eight years ago. But somehow I'm still going back to the, the readiness role, providing workshops, speaking at conferences when we can do that. Um, but my day-to-day -day job is providing training where the last two years it was all virtual, and luckily it's sh slightly shifting again to in-person as well. So my two prime topics is Azure Architecting, anyone into Exim certification, it's like a AZ-305, and Azure DevOps, or I would say Microsoft DevOps Solutions, AZ-400. So that's uh, my prime focus, I would say. In a bit of free time, I'm still going back to Azure, writing a couple of books. Um, if you behave, if you ask good questions, 
I might be able to give a, a couple of them away virtually because we're shifting to virtual worlds. Anyway, cool. What is DevOps? DevOps is complex. DevOps is easy. Depends how you look at it, depends on your background. But in the end, it's helping your organization. There's a formal definition, you can read it, I'm not going to talk it out. Why not? Because I got my own definition. My definition is integrating a culture, super important. DevOps is a little bit of tooling. DevOps is a big part on culture. How can we integrate, glue those two worlds together? And you all know you've got like a development team, you've got the ops team, not really friends or at least not during day-to-day -day business, maybe after hours, Friday afternoon, four o'clock, they're like publishing something, deploying something, and eventually who needs to fix it? The IT team, right? So that's what DevOps is trying to fix. But ultimately, you're gonna provide value to your business whether it's your internal organization or maybe towards your customers. Now, most important is culture. If you're starting with DevOps, it's nothing technical. It's gluing those worlds together. Being friends within your organization or making friends within your organization. Because apart from the developers and the ops, like the, the obvious audience, it's everything around project management. It's about your business tools. It's about your um, customer requests and so many more things. And it's only 40% tools. Where interesting enough, out of my session, it's probably going to be about 100% tools and just a little bit on culture. But that's just because I wanted to deliver a technical session. Now, looking at DevOps, you saw there's this nice continuous motion where if you move this into a linear line, it looks a little bit like this. It all starts with developers. They come up with the idea. Well, maybe before that, you got the business asking for a tool or a solution or um, an e-commerce application or anything like that, right? So once the uh, technical project kicks off, developers are gonna build something. And from there, they need to validate. And from there, they need to package it, creating like a web deploy zip package file could be one option. Um, maybe moving into Docker. Anyone using Docker? Although there's only two Kubernetes, but that's not gonna stop you from using Docker, right? So that's where you're gonna build a package and eventually you're gonna run it. And once it's running, that's typically where, I would say partly the ops team comes in and all the way end, they're going to operate it, they're going to monitor it, they're going to manage it. And from there, depending on the workload, depending on the workload type, depending how customers are using it, how your users are using it, you go all the way back to the beginning. Like, hey, developer, we got a long list of features. Or maybe, worst case, we got a long list of bugs for you to fix, right? Where the, the ops part is only a small portion of it. And then maybe out of the, the success factor of your tool or your customers or your internal organization, your solution is expanding, you need more servers, you need maybe cloud migration, moving from your on-prem data center into cloud, and that's where the ops team comes in again, and you know it's that continuous motion. That's what we're doing. Where ultimately you're gonna automate everything. From the development cycle all the way to operations and moving into that continuous cycle. That's in short what DevOps is about, right? Well now we're still gonna do the same thing, but we're gonna secure everything. What's coming to mind? Any tool, any practice that you're using? No? Say that again, sorry. Anything coming to mind when I say secure everything? How would that work in any of those cycles within the DevOps process? Uh, rank policies. For example, yeah. Pipeline validations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else? What's that? Tools. Yep. Mm -hmm. You might want to repeat what people are saying for the recording. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, or you can speak out as well. Uh, no, they, your mic. they can it's hold you. The recording, I think, only gets your mic. So. Oh, okay. No, no, totally fine. Now, I'll, I'll just show them because then it maps with um, the, the slides as well. So just a couple of things. On the development side, you can do threat modeling. That's where you're going to find out, like, what is my application landscape looking like and what are the potential threats before you even start building something. Validating um, secure code. Integrating branch policies, one of the examples that you brought forward. Then you're gonna validate. You're gonna run code scanning overall with so many different scenarios, so many different tools, and I'll show you a couple of them later on. Then you're gonna package it. That's where it becomes like a little artifact, could be a Docker container, could be um, infrastructure as code, ARM templates, BICEP, Terraform templates, where you wanna make sure that no one is storing um, secrets 
inside that Terraform template, for example, or any other infrastructure as code scenario. And then you're gonna run it, where if it's running on-prem, you're gonna integrate with your network security. You're gonna integrate with firewalls. You need to talk to your uh, security teams. You need to think about authorization. You need to think about authentication. Who can do what with my application, stuff like that. And then eventually, when it is running, you need to integrate security monitoring. And again, this is just a couple of bullets that I could fit on one single slide, right? There's probably a lot more than that as well. Now, the problem is that in most scenarios, your security is kicking in all the way at the end. That's where your workload is running. That's where you're going to find out that an attacker, a hacker is trying to get into your environment. That's where your servers are running, where you're going to install um, like an anti-malware tool, but mainly firewalling network security, but also your users connecting to the application. And I think we can all agree that your users are probably one of the potentially weak spots in your scenario as well. And that's where you got like endpoint protection and so many other security features that you can bring in, right? So what are we gonna do with shifting left? When your bomb is exploding, that's where your security attack is happening, we're gonna make sure that we go all the way back to the beginning. That's what DevSecOps is about. We're not changing the process. The cycle is still the same, but we're gonna integrate security in each and every of those. Sounds good? Familiar to some of you already? Cool. From here, it's gonna be mainly demos, just a couple of placeholder slides, because I might forget some stuff that I wanted to show you. So I'm quickly gonna walk through each and every of those, um, yeah, six, seven cycles, where the first one is threat modeling. Just one example, Microsoft Threat Modeling Tool. It's a free tool, it looks a little bit ancient, I would say. Not used to this resolution. I hope it's not needing to update again. But that's a cool thing. It looks pretty old, but it's actually still getting updated. Anyone using Microsoft Threat Modeling already? Cool. At least one. That's good. So what it's about is um, starting from a sample diagram. And this looks a little bit weird, but we can fix that. I hope. Come on. And now, obviously, the recording kicks in as well. Well, good enough. So what it does here is allowing you to build up like a, a pretty generic flow. And it can be super, super generic. That's just this one single example. Where you start with an incoming action, moving to HTTPS, where most probably it means like it's a web application. Everything within the red box is what we call the trusted boundary. Think of it as your web server. Users connect to it, users start connecting to data, reading out the front page, maybe moving into a storage backend, pulling up some product information on like an e-commerce website um, or anything else not important. And it means that from within that web server, there is also a flow to the data backend. This could be on-prem, this could be cloud, any tool, it doesn't need to be Microsoft, right? Now, where it becomes more important is that for each and every of those, again, for now it's pretty generic, it's gonna show you potential threats. This is just the architecting part. Your solution architects are thinking about like, this is the workload we're gonna build, it's an e-commerce, two tier, three tier, and we're just gonna move it into this thread model. And from there, we're immediately gonna tell you like, well, this is what's happening. If you deploy this kind of workload, these are the threats we already know of. Where now the next step is to your developers, like, hey, watch out. We need to integrate security for our HTTPS tree. We need to make sure that, for example, in Azure, our web server, connecting to our database backend, Cosmos DB, SQL Server, um, anything else that you want to run, preferably using like service principles or managed identities. That's what we're going to do for the developers. And then obviously on the op side, it's typically a little bit easier. You're still going to integrate your firewalling, you're going to integrate your server hardening and so many other things. That's a starting point. Your thinking process, knowing what you're going to build, and from there, we're going to start building it. So building it means that we're going to shift to our Azure DevOps environment. And the starting point there would be repos. You probably are familiar with branches. Anyone not familiar with branches? Yes, no, maybe? Yes, no, maybe? No, yes, yes, okay, good. Are branches by themselves security features? 
like instead of all connecting to the, the main branch, giving each and every developer or ops team, DevOps member overall, just giving them an individual branch, is that a security feature? The branch itself, not really, right? Because the branch itself is just a copy of the main branch and maybe a subset of it. Where the security comes in is branch policies, like one example that our friend here already mentioned. So what we can do is creating a new branch. It's pretty easy, I guess, to do. And more important is moving to your branch. So I got something happening. My apologies, but I'm afraid it's the recording tool kicking in, but we'll probably fix that. So I got a branch, I got a whole bunch of branches, nothing really to worry about. And what you can do for each and one of them, let's do the PDT DevOps command, is defining branch policies. If it wants to. Come on, branch policies, you can do that. screen help people with there we go so what we can define in branch policies is for example approvals it means that anyone who's gonna um, publish new application source code or making changes in the source code the code itself is not getting accepted unless somebody's gonna approve it that's like peer reviewing how we call it in the industry if somebody goes through your code which could be a human being or maybe later on, we're gonna integrate a, a code scanning tool. It means that as long as we detect something suspicious, could be like um, outdated packages in your source code. If you're still developing with code that's like 10, 15 years old, most probably it's gonna be pretty vulnerable, right? So you wanna make sure that your developers, although the code is technically still fine, you're gonna move it to like a linting tool, validating syntax and stuff like that. It's not gonna tell you like, oh, this is wrong. It's just going to tell you, well, okay, cool, syntax looks fine. But on the other side, we know that it's like five-year-old, seven-year-old, maybe 15 or longer years old, um, outdated code. That's where you're going to integrate the branch policies. Integrating, first of all, for now, I would say the approvers would be a good step. Next to that, it's not really um, always looked at from a security perspective, but it's integrating with work items. And you might go, well, okay, cool, this is an Azure DevOps tool. But... The process is not changing. Anyone using GitHub, GitHub Actions? Yep, some of you, cool. Process is the same, the mindset is the same. Um, I'm gonna save you the demo because obviously I got other tools to talk about, but again, the main concept remains the same. You're gonna move your source code into GitHub and maybe you're still gonna run your pipelines in Azure DevOps. Could be classic pipelines. Most of my examples are classic because it's typically a bit, I would say, user-friendly. Or, or DevOps team friendly, where YAML is just showing code and that's not always that useful um, to just talk through the demo. But the process is not changing. If you wanna build your source code based on YAML pipelines later on, or running your code <laughs> based on pipelines later on, the process is not changing. Even better, the tools, the mechanisms are not changing either. So that's mainly it. ADO security scanner, I'm not gonna show you. I have it if you wanna see it later on, I could do that. But what it's gonna do is actually looking at how secure is your Azure DevOps environment running. But if you're not using Azure DevOps, then obviously it's not really gonna help you. Or you go like, well, that's good to know, but not really that interesting. Good. Second step, that's where we're gonna validate code. We're gonna develop it, we're gonna validate it. How can we validate code? Easy said, code analysis, code scanning tools. There's a whole bunch of them. Just throw any names while I'm shifting to my browser and opening up where you can find what is available. And the reason why the movement is a little bit hard is because I lost my cursor, but we'll fix that. So the landing page I would say is marketplace.visualstudio.com. So what you have over there, I'll try to make it a little bit smaller, is integration for Visual Studio Visual Studio Code, if you go like, well, we're not really developers, but we're using VS Code for PowerShell scripts or um, Terraform templates or anything like that. And later on, we got Azure DevOps. So the marketplace, although it has Visual Studio in the name, it's not just for developers. Where you find a whole list of tools, and it's not that impressive on a larger resolution, 
But you can see that everything that allows you to integrate with any of those three worlds can be found from here. Since we're talking about security, let's do security. Last week it was 135. Oh, we lost three tools. Hmm, no idea why it could be because they're working on updates. If you're using Visual Studio as a developer, 132 plugins, you could say extensions, to integrate something security related in your developer cycle. Well, now we go to Azure DevOps. Any idea, more or less? More security in Azure DevOps than in Visual Studio? 16. 16? 16. 16. 16. 1.6? I'm gonna make you so happy. Last week was 85. 94. Woohoo! Are you happy now? <laughs> yeah, way cool. 94, obviously, I cannot demo all 94 of them. I'm gonna just handpick a couple of them. If you wanna see other ones, then we can try and do something else. But again, that's not the message. Because again, it's all about that culture. We're gonna integrate security in each and every cycle of the DevOps process. What tool are you gonna use in the end? I don't really care. What could be important? Some tools are better than other ones, like everything else we know about, right? Some tools are better for um, .NET language. Some tools are better for Java, for Node, for maybe um, some other uh, coding platforms. Other tools, like the one you see here on the front, Aqua, is specifically targeting containers. If you're not using containers, but you still love the concept of code security scanning, you're probably not gonna use Aqua because it only recognizes Docker containers. That's the logic behind it. The next step is obviously how do we integrate it? Imagine you got your DevOps process today. You go into, I'm just gonna try my touch because not seeing my cursor is pretty, pretty painful to navigate. So we go into our existing pipelines. Can be build pipelines where you're gonna um, test your code, you're gonna validate it, you're gonna run it, package it, compile it, and then maybe later on you're gonna move to release. That's where you're gonna literally deploy it um, or at least providing like a, a final um, artifact. Any of these pipelines, and again it's classic, but if you want I could show you the same with YAML syntax. Pretty generic, so this is just for a .NET application, but in the end it works for any language. We're gonna start from downloading the latest NuGet version. We're gonna run NuGet Restore, like compiling the package in the, the build solution, and eventually all the way at the end, producing an artifact. That's what we're doing. We're now you go like, okay, we learned something today, and I hope you're actually learning something today. Where now you go into any of those 94 security tools. For example, SNCC. Not doing any marketing, it's not a Microsoft product, but just one of the so many that I remember from that uh, marketplace. So the only thing you need to do is obviously creating like a, a SNCC account. I need to learn not to use my cursor because I'm not seeing it anyway. It's gonna move it into my task and most probably you're gonna move this like right before or after the build solution. And that's, I would say, easy move into your documentation from the, the third party vendor and just validate how they're recommending the usage. Some tools are really good all the way at the, um, at the start. Some other ones are sometimes asking you to install like two or three different cycles. Where the first cycle is, I'm gonna download the latest security um, detection database from the vendor. Next, I'm just gonna read the code. I'm gonna scan the code, but not really um, like doing something with it. And then all the way at the end, that's where I'm gonna simulate a running application. And again, could be a little bit different for any of those. If these are containers, I know the pipeline is not really container friendly, but that's obviously not that important. I would go into my tool again. And obviously my pipeline would be like a, some Docker command line tools where I would do Docker build, starting from a Docker file. Where now I can actually simulate something else. Where now I could rely on multiple tools. I could go on, um, hey, can you please scan my Docker container? Where before I'm using my SNCC or again any of the other 92 ones to just read the code and provide me feedback. Why? Because in between you have your source code where on the other side you're going to integrate uh, an already existing Docker container that you just grabbed from Docker Hub 
But you don't really know, like, is that actually a secured container? Because in the end, you don't always know where that baseline container comes from. And that's going to give you, like, two different security baselines. It's going to scan your code that's already been approved out of your approval step in the branch policies. But now next to that, specifically for the kind of workload or the kind of artifact you have, you're also going to integrate specific security scanning tools. That's the main scenario. Another example, I told you I was just going to show you some tools, is white source. Anyone using white source? Yep, cool. Happy about it? Yeah. Why am I showing you? Because, again, it all depends on the tools. Uh, the other one, uh, I got another console that I could show you. We'll figure that out. There we go. So what this shows you here out of um, white source is vulnerability score. I need to be honest, this code that I'm using in my demo project is like seven years old. Because otherwise it's all gonna show up as almost green and go like, oh, okay, is that all the only thing it figures out? Well now it's obviously showing you a little bit more. Let's see if this works, that'd be cool. So even recording software is still working as it should be. So what it's gonna tell you here is I'm detecting vulnerabilities. This is a web application connecting to that database backend where it's relying on a pretty outdated uh, Microsoft OData um, package. And it's gonna tell me the reason why it's flagged as high risk. First of all, we know it's like seven year old code, which by itself could already be a message like, well, maybe we're not doing it that good. But we all know that on the other side, it's not always that easy to just move to the latest and greatest stuff, any source, um, source code language, right? Because we got application lifecycle. We have developers who are still familiar with any of the um, original languages and maybe not looking in, in the newer scenarios. And that's where, again, this tool is going to help you. And if you want, I could install any other tool, but obviously that's not, um, I would say, that important for now. Now, the last thing back to the marketplace is that you can, again, start from the local developer workstation. You're going to integrate tool XYZ on the developer workstation. Integrating with Visual Studio, with VS Code, if you're not using Microsoft tools, you're using um, Eclipse or IntelliJ or uh, any other development environment, not that important for now. No idea where the beeps are coming from. I hope the recording is still working. Um, worst case, I still have the same sessions with all the demos and the recording already, but they wanted to integrate it here. Um, but the benefit is that you could now talk to your developers like, we want you to integrate those security tools on your local development workstation. Maybe literally forcing them, like building like a, a development workstation and forcing them to just use those tools. Where on top of that, once the code is moved into Azure DevOps or GitHub Actions or GitHub overall, it's gonna be the exact same scenario. And again, leveraging on the benefit of integrating multiple tools together. Still good? Learning something? Cool. Other potential security issues, this is an example, and I told you it's not just about Azure DevOps, but what I did here, well, actually not me, but this was in one of my first weeks within Microsoft. I joined June 90, uh, 2019, and a couple of months after I did a demo on, uh, or a training on Azure DevOps, and somewhere at the end of the day, got a call from the Microsoft Security Center. Now there's a couple of teams within Microsoft that you don't want you to get a call from, and one of them is the security center, because it means you misbehaved. And I was like, wait a minute, I didn't do anything. So what's the problem? They go like, well, we found a Azure DevOps personal access token on GitHub. I was like, oh, that's not good. Um, where does it come from? He's like, well, you need to tell me. I'm like, I didn't do anything. I'm just providing training on Azure DevOps. And mm, wait a minute, I did something with a security tool. And I did a demo, and yes, I was using a personal access token. So yeah, yeah, that's my mistake. Now on the other side, what happened, and that's what literally happened here, and it's so much fun to just show you, but there was someone stealing my live um, personal access token demo, literally walking through a demo on Sonar Cloud, but that's not even that important. Just one of the so many other security tools where you need to build in that integration between the third-party tool, any of the 94 that I showed you, and Azure DevOps. One way to build that integration is a personal access token. It's like some sort of um, authentication key 
that allows you to interact different software with each other. Really that easy. So I'm grabbing that personal access token, copying it over into the third party tool, and from there, allowing me that integration to become part of my pipelines. So what this gentleman did was literally capturing one of my, uh, my live demos, capturing a screenshot on his side, that's the downside of virtual classes, and storing my pad in his GitHub. Now within just a couple of minutes, the Microsoft security team figured that out. And you go like, wow, okay, Peter, nice story, but we all know that we should not share paths. I was like, yeah, well, I know that as well. And I was never really imagining that any of my students would literally run a screenshot capture when I'm like presenting, right? I mean, you could, well, not anymore because I'm not showing you how to create a path, but you could still create a, like a, an image or something. And then I would tell them like, hey, gentlemen, what are you doing, right? But in virtual, it's always a little bit harder. Now, the other interesting part is that I told you it's a lot about Azure DevOps, but GitHub has the exact same. So if you search for um, GitHub security, that's like the only two keywords you need to remember, it's gonna send you to this extensive documentation. And if you read through all the details, but I'm not gonna do that for now, it's gonna tell you like what are the security patterns GitHub if you move source code into GitHub and what can we detect. So one of them is Azure DevOps personal access tokens. Another one is um, AWS uh, service principle, but they don't call it service principle. But you probably get the idea. Like a service account with typically a huge amount of admin permissions, that allows you to interact with AWS. If you store that into um, any GitHub repo, public or private, within a second it's gonna block you like, please don't store that in our GitHub repos. Um, Azure storage accounts, connection strings, uh, SQL Azure, same thing. Cosmos DB, I'm not sure, but I think in the meantime it's also detected. And a lot of other tools, if you use Adobe Cloud, if you use Citrix Cloud, if you use um, Google Cloud, it will also tell you like, this looks like a secret and I don't want you to store it. So the next step is, how can we avoid storing secrets hard-coded in our source code? Any idea? Yes, no? Secret management? Any tool coming to mind? Key Vault is a good one. CyberArk, a good one. Another one. Psychotic. Which one? Tychotic. Tychotic? Okay, yeah, sure. So I can show you Key Vault because it's an Azure product, so it's a little bit easier for me to show. So we go back into our pipelines. Or at least we try, right? Luckily, there's touch. Like any pipeline, you need to define some variables. I don't have any real variables here. I'm not even gonna run the pipelines. I'll make it a little bit bigger. These are just system variables. Nothing really secretly, I would say. But maybe, since I told you it's a web application, let's go back to the tasks. That's all web, and all the way at the end, we're gonna add a new task, and we're gonna integrate uh, SQL database, uh, database deployment, why not? Running on Azure or, oh, that's one too many, but that's totally fine. We're out of the settings in our pipeline. We need to provide a database name, a login and a password. I could go in and type in my super duper, or oh, it needs to be a more complex, one, two, three, a, and a complex character, that's my password. That's obviously not my real password, you probably get the idea. So what we're gonna do right now is not storing the password here, but we go into our variables. And we're gonna add a new one. So the first option you have, this is again Azure DevOps specific. We're gonna provide a variable name, SQL password. And we're gonna paste it in here. And there's a little lock. Look at my screen over here but the recording interferes. I'm not gonna tell you anymore because you already know, and I'm protecting my variable. I'm not gonna say it's not safe enough, but it's not good enough. Why not? Because this is specifically to Azure DevOps. This is even specifically to Azure DevOps Classic. If you use YAML, then the way of working is gonna be completely different. 
So I'm not going to say forget about it. I mean, I'm talking about security. This is one of the easiest ways. But there is a better way where I'm going to show you Azure Key Vault, or at least how to integrate with Azure Key Vault. So the same logic, and that's the nice thing. Instead of just creating a variable, you go into your variable groups. I'm probably just going to share a whole bunch of pre-recorded demos already because this is just painful. So the only thing you need to remember is that it's not just creating a variable, like I showed you for the SQL password, but you need to create a variable group. Slightly different, but the concept is the same. Well, now where it becomes important and interesting is that just by setting this flag, it's going to allow you to link to Azure Key Vault. It's an Azure service that allows you to store um, secrets, encrypted data in a protected way. There's a lot of security in place. For example, if I would move on, it's going to ask me, like, what is your Azure um, subscription? It's my Microsoft one and my Key Vault one. Where from here, it's going to ask me for authorization. Where now you could go like, okay, I'm going to push that authorize button and who magically it's all working, right? But that's not what happens in a real organizational scenario because at this moment in time, it's connecting with my Peter at Microsoft account to my Azure DevOps environment. From there, it's connecting to my Peter at Microsoft Azure subscription, where interesting enough, yes, I'm, I'm the admin of my subscription. But in real life, that's never really happening. So your developers or DevOps teams who are using Azure DevOps, they don't have permissions to push that authorize button. So what they need to do is asking the security team, can you please create a secret in Key Vault? And can you provide permissions for my Azure DevOps project? And that's what we call a service principle or managed identity, depending what kind of deployment scenario you're using. But you're going to create a secret to establish that authorization, the secured connection from Azure DevOps to your key vault. Where on top of that, you only need to get and list permissions. So your security team can be sure that your DevOps pipeline, because that's in the end what it's about, your DevOps pipeline is going to read out the uh, secret. You as the DevOps runner, I mean, not the server who's running the pipeline, but the human being in front of it, you cannot even see the secret. So that's the nice thing about it. Well, now our secret stored in source code, whether it's Azure DevOps repos, whether it's GitHub or maybe some other source control system, even on-prem uh, DevOps server, GitHub server on-prem, it's all going to save you from this nightmare. And that's why I'm still working at Microsoft. We're almost there, Docker containers. Only a handful of you are using Docker and containers, so I'm not going to drill down too much, but you already know the concept. Everything's the exact same thing. So again, just a couple of tools I already showed you. What did I do just going to that marketplace, filtering on containers, looking at what a container extension is available with a security mindset, and just giving you like five, six different ones. Anyone using or familiar with OWASP? Several of you, good. So even that one can be integrated. It's not here, but we do have a little bit of time. So for the ones who don't know, OWASP is like a, an open consortium between like industry security vendors. Microsoft, AWS, Google, a lot of security vendors or traditional security vendors. Uh, Trend Micro is in there. Um, F5 for the load balancing appliances. Uh, Cisco for the networking, and, and again, so many other ones. Checkpoint, WatchGuard, and most probably, I don't know, like 50 other ones, right? So what they're doing out of OWASP is providing you security threat modeling, where I started my session like 45 minutes ago, but helping you in detecting vulnerabilities. Well, now the last part, we could take it one step further. And going into our Azure environment, well, you probably know we got Azure Security Center. It's been rebranded to Microsoft Defender for Cloud. Azure Sentinel, that's like the, the um, reporting SIEM solution in the cloud, allowing you to build out security incidents. But since we talked about like a web front end and a database back end, it means that within Azure, you're going to deploy a load balancer. Just going to make this a little bit smaller. 
where within load balancer, well not Azure load balancer, but if you deploy Azure application gateway or Azure front door, which is doing about the same but across multiple regions, you can extend it with a web application firewall. Now what a web application firewall is doing is giving you a rule base. And just gonna wait a second. Where the rule base that we offer out of Azure, out of the box, you just need to pay for that web application firewall option on top of App Gateway or Front Door. It's also based on OWASP. So if you take your DevOps concept, all the way at the end of the cycle, we're now in the operations part, where your existing on-prem data center probably is gonna, hopefully I would say, is gonna run some on-prem security. Most probably, I hope, that it's using a decent firewall, a decent load balancer, allowing you to do package um, inspection or packet filtering. That's what OWASP is about. Well, now you're maybe moving to a DevOps cycle where you could integrate your OWASP scanning as part of your pipelines. Before your web application is pushed to your on-prem web server farm, is pushed to Azure, is pushed to AWS, Google Cloud, or anywhere else on the planet, you're gonna make sure that my pipeline is green. It means that there's no security vulnerability. So it's gonna run some kind of web server um, simulation as part of your pipeline, before it's gonna publish your code and running it on a full-blown platform. All based on the same concept, same standards. And I think with that, we're almost done. So what I'm gonna do is repeating my same um, DevOps, but adding security all the way at the end. Because it fits in that definition, and obviously you already know that for now we need to have security all over the place. Before you start developing or before your DevOps team starts developing something, think about a threat modeling. Can be the Microsoft tool or something else. Again, it's not about the tools, it's about the culture. Any questions? Okay, so the question is, do I have any, I would say, pipeline best practices, pipeline guidance, like this is what a pipeline concept should be about? Um, the ADO scanner is the first thing come to mind because I already mentioned it. So that one allows you to um, yeah, tell you like this is any potential security risk in, in the Azure DevOps specific environment, uh, but it's also gonna flag any potential risks in a pipeline that's maybe not doing it, uh, what it should do, um, highlighting um, any secrets or secret patterns that are not defined in, in a, a secretly way. So that would be one. Um, GitHub has about the same, where you don't even need to do anything. So there's a Dependabot is the engine they're using where you just move it into um, well, the source code, you move it into GitHub, next you're gonna build GitHub Actions, like the, the pipelines, and it's already having security integrated. So, and then there's a difference obviously between public repos, private repos, there's a, a difference in the, the free edition where it's just gonna flag you, and if you move to an enterprise edition, which I guess most organizations are doing, then it's gonna give you more details as well. So that could be, could be one. Um, Apart from that, I would say, um, yeah, go through the cycle as I presented it. Um, it's gonna give you the different cycles. This is what a pipeline is about. We need to know from the start that we are using branches, that we have branch policies, that we have um, approvals, that we're gonna use pull requests. And from there on, you're slightly gonna move up and integrating security all the way. That's it. Good. If you want to stay in touch, feel free, petender at microsoft.com or pdtit all over the place. If you remember pdtit, that's uh, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. I'm not on Instagram or Snapchat because I'm getting too old for that. But apart from that, feel free to reach out, stay in touch, ask questions. That's what I'm here for. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>